Hey everybody. So today we're going to be going over um, the last part of the OCHEM Fundamentals Toolkit. We're going to be talking about stereoisomers and um, chirality. All right, so um, one of the things that we need to do in order to be able to thoroughly discuss stereoisomers is understand the con angled prelog rules. And so these guys are just to be what you, if you haven't heard of the rules, this is just how you determine absolute configuration, which is R and S stereochemistry. So, our rules will be for a given stereo center, which we defined last week as any carbon that has four different substituent groups. For a given center, stereo center, step one will be to rank the four substituent groups in terms of what we call priority. And so the way that priority will work is it will be ranked by atomic number. And if there is a tie, we will compare the next atoms we compare the next atoms until we find a difference and rule number 2 will be if group 4 our lowest priority group is on a dashed line. If group four is on a dash, then we count and if we count one, two, three clockwise, that will be an R stereocenter. So we're always just counting one, two, three, when we have group four on a dash. If we do our one, two, three, and we find it is counterclockwise, that will be an S stereo center. <clears throat> okay, so that'll be for the case where group four is on a dash. If group four is not on a dash, we'll have to do an extra step. Okay. Any questions before I move on and start to erase? And we can then discuss what happens when group four is not on a dash. Okay. So for the scenario where group four is not on a dash, if group four is not on a dash. And this method, there's a couple different ways that people will do this. <clears throat> there's the rotation way. So if you're very good at three-dimensional reasoning, you can rotate your stereo center so that group four becomes um, in the back or on a dash. Uh, but for most people, um, rotating things in three-dimensional space can be a little bit problematic, especially under timed conditions on the MCAT. And so um, we like to have a backup method that is completely foolproof. And the method that is completely foolproof is, if group four is not on a dash, we redraw, we swap group four with whoever 
is on a dash. And then we do R and S via rule number two, which is that if we do one, two, three, and it's clockwise, then that is an R stereocenter. And if we do one, two, three, and it is counterclockwise, that is an S stereocenter. Okay. So, however, because we swapped group four with whoever it was on a dash, and this is going to be a rule with stereochemistry. Whenever we switch two groups on a given stereocenter, chiral center, we have switched R to S or S to R. So then the R and S that we determine after swapping is the opposite. So then we will also swap R and S. Okay. So we're swapping group four with whoever is on the dash, then we swap the R and S that we get. Any questions on that? Let's go ahead and apply that to some molecules. Some examples for us. For starters, we have We have this guy. Okay. So in terms of stereocenters, how many stereocenters do we have? Yeah, we should just have one stereocenter right here. And for this method to work, we're gonna need to show any and all hydrogens that are on our stereocenter. And then when it comes to priority, um, who's gonna have our number one priority here? Our OH, perfect. <clears throat> so we'll give our OH a one. And because oxygen is a higher priority, is a higher atomic number than hydrogen or carbon or carbon. And then hydrogen, what uh, number would we assign for hydrogen? Four, perfect. Now we have a tie at the first carbon away from the stereocenter. So how do we differentiate between methyl and ethyl? Is ethyl or methyl going to get the two? Ethyl is, perfect. So in the case where we don't have any other substituent groups, we can use degree of substitution. So tertiary will be a higher level of priority than secondary will be a higher level of priority than primary will be a higher priority than methyl. So of course we have a secondary versus a methyl here, or I guess a, I guess methyl we can define in this case is just primary because it has to be coming off of a stereocenter. So we have secondary versus primary. And of course our secondary will win. We'll give it a two and a three. So we do our check, is hydrogen number four, is group number four in a dash? We do have group four in a dash. So then we've satisfied our rule of having the fourth priority substituent on the dash. So we can simply do our one, two, three, and we'll go one, two, three, and would that be R or S? That will be S, right? We're doing counterclockwise and we found S. So any questions on an example where hydrogen is on a dash? Okay, so then what do I have here? Trying to read my own writing. Okay. Another example. What would happen, what is this D 
that we have here? What does that represent? So that's going to be the isotope of hydrogen, deuterium. And just for good measure, if we have a hydrogen with two neutrons, we call that tritium. So we have a deuterium. So who do we think is going to win, hydrogen or deuterium, in terms of priority? Who's going to get the higher priority? So in this case, because deuterium has an extra neutron, even though they tie in terms of atomic number, they're both hydrogens, <clears throat> deuterium is going to win over hydrogen. And of course, we have our ethyl and our methyl for one and two. So now we have a case, we'll do our check. Perfect, yeah, deuterium is gonna be higher priority than hydrogen. So we'll do our check and is group number four on a dash where it should be, or do we have to do a silky swap? <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> Gonna have to do a quick swap. So we will swap in this case, three and four, because our goal with R and S is to have group four on a dash. And now it is group four is on a dash. However, when we determine our R and S, which in this case, one, two, three, would be R or S. Should be S. However, because we swapped groups three and four, this is actually R. All right, so this is how we handle an example where group four is not on a dash. We swap group four with whoever is on a dash. That could be one, it could be two, it could be three. In a lot of cases, it is one um, because a lot of substituent groups will be like a bromine or a chlorine. But in this case, it was three. And this is your foolproof way for handling RNS configuration when group four is not on a dash. So let's try a couple more of these. So let me give you a ring. And so we have how many stereo centers here? Now we have two stereo centers, good. So we will start by drawing in our hydrogens. Hydrogen, we have a hydrogen. We know hydrogens are always gonna be four if they're present on a stereo center. And let's start with our top right stereo center. What priority will we give to bromine? Bromine's gonna be our one here. I mean, it has the highest atomic number. And then we're comparing two carbons. So we have our top carbon and our bottom right carbon. And which one is going to be group number two? The one that's further away from the OH or closer to the OH? Closer to the OH is gonna be two. So we have a tie between carbons, but one of them is closer to an oxygen and so we'll give that one the higher priority. And then we'll give that one three. Now we have another case. In this case, one and four will have to swap so that we can get four on a dash where it belongs. We'll do our one, two, three. And would that be R or S? Perfect, nice. It would be S, but we will swap it to R. Excellent. And then we also have hydrogen, four, oxygen, one, carbon that's closer to the bromine, two, 
carbon that's further from the bromine three. And this one's nice because four is already in the back where we want it. One, two, three. And this will be R or S. Another S, perfect. Any questions on this example? All right, let's do an MCAT thing where they show it to us in a way that we're not super comfortable with because we know the MCAT do love to do that. So how many stereo centers do we have in this molecule? Should just be one, perfect. <clears throat> so we have our one stereo center. Now this is a little tricky because we don't seem to have any three-dimensional like dashes and wedges specified, but we will have the OH is gonna be like above the ring, right? And the hydrogen is gonna be like below the ring. So for an example like this, we're gonna go ahead and redraw And OH, is it gonna be on a dash or a wedge? OH should be on a wedge, perfect. And then we'll go ahead and assign our priorities so we know that hydrogen is gonna be four whenever it's present. And then this is a little trickier because we have, let's label our carbons, uh, We'll call this A, B, C, and D. And we'll call this oxygen, oxygen with a dot. This is a little trickier because now we have a tie between oxygens. And so when we have a tie, um, this may be obvious to you if you're watching this, but we also wanna have a like foolproof technique for when there is a tie. So what you can do is you can specify the carbon, which was A, which is our stereo center. And the carbon that's a stereo center should have four different substituent groups. We can draw like sort of a tree diagram here. And so we have O with a dot. We have hydroxyl. We have carbon B. And we have hydrogen, which we already determined was four. And so the way that this kind of tree diagram would work is you would extend any ties to their next atom. In the case of an oxygen, because they're only making two bonds, we only have to go one atom out um, at a time until we find a difference. So O with a dot is gonna have a bond of carbon versus O with a hydrogen. And so O with a dot, will that be one or two? O with a dot will be group one and hydroxyl will be group two. So you can do this for carbons as well. If we had a tie between carbons, we'd actually draw three bonds out because you know carbons like to make four bonds and one of their bonds is already to the stereo center carbon. And so our carbon B for instance would have one bond to carbon which is carbon C and two bonds to hydrogen. This is how the kind of tree diagram would work. And this will be helpful for you know larger more confusing looking uh, molecules. All right. And then this is a nice example too, because we already have hydrogen on a dash. So we can simply do R123. And do we get R or S? So we went counterclockwise again. So this should be an S. Any questions for an example that's drawn in a weird way to try to trip you up? All 
Okay, so let's do some more definitions. We've tackled our con angled prelog rules. Very, very high yield for the MCAT. Um, I won't say it's going to get you a point on every MCAT, but it'll get you at least one point on, I would say, the majority of MCATs at least have one question of determining RNS. So let's talk some more definitions. Chirality. <clears throat> So chirality is rotating plane polarized light in a pure sample. So you've probably heard this definition before. You may be familiar with this idea of rotating plane polarized light, um, but this is a good thing to go over because Definition wise, we could always get a concept question. We could have the concept of chirality in a passage. So what does it mean to have to rotate plane polarized light? So let's say we took like a flashlight, some kind of light source that is just simply sending light in all directions. And let's say that we took a opaque film with a thin slit. So such that when our light encounters this opaque um, film, it can only pass through in a single direction. Uh, can non-chiral centers rotate light? Um, in our definition of chiral centers for the MCAT, um, only chiral centers can rotate plane polarized light. Uh, you, the, the answer to your question for the MCAT is no, um, but the answer in real life is yes, but it's a little bit beyond our scope for the time being. Yeah. So what we have done here is we have plane polarized our light, give myself enough space here. If we then have our sample in like some sort of cuvette and we have a film for detection, if our light is rotated counterclockwise, we would call this minus. And so the little minus will indicate that that sample, a pure sample of that compound will rotate light counterclockwise. And you may also see little l. And little l is different from big L. We'll go over that in a bit. Um, but little l will also indicate that a sample will rotate light to the left. They call little l levitorotary. So if you see this word levitorotary, it means that a pure sample of that compound rotates light in a counterclockwise direction. And if we have a clockwise rotation of light, we call that plus. So if you get like a plus 15 degrees or plus 30 degrees or something like that, that sample is rotating light in a clockwise direction. And we would also call that little d, little d being dextrorotary. And so if you see this term dextrorotary, that means that that sample will rotate light in a clockwise direction. So any questions on our definition so far? Awesome. Okay, um, so chirality is going to be rotation of plane polarized light in a pure sample. And for MCAT purposes, to be a chiral compound, you must have one or more chiral centers, but you cannot be meso. So let's go ahead and quickly define meso. Any questions before we move on? So 
what is a meso compound? A meso compound is going to be a compound with chiral centers that is completely symmetric. A compound with chiral centers that is completely symmetric. And the a meso compound will be a chiral. It does not rotate clean polarized light. So let's, at, let's look at an example compound. Say we had something looking like this. Would this be a meso compound? Tricky, right? Tough to see. So what the MCAT me has done here is we have switched the uh, direction or we've rotated a bond here. And so we're gonna go ahead and rotate our bond. This is a good example that I've incorporated for bond rotations that you may occasionally, very rarely actually have to do on the MCAT. And so the goal would be to get bromine pointing up so we can see if bromine pointing up is on a dash or a wedge. We'll draw also our hydrogen in. And so what we have right now, we have our methyl is going up and out. We have our hydrogen is going up and back. We have our bromine is in the plane. Okay, so for this example, bromine is gonna be orange, methyl is going to be on our black and bromine as hydrogen is going to be <coughs> excuse me on a on our blue marker so our goal remember is to get bromine pointing up so if we rotate we started like this if we rotate bromine up our methyl is now pointing down and to the right our methyl is now pointing down and to the right our bromine is now it was here right Hydrogen is in the back, methyl is coming up and out. Bromine is going down and to the right. Our bromine is now up and to the back. Which, spoiler alert, our other bromine is also. And then our hydrogen is gonna be out and on a wedge. So just one more time, go over this example. And this is how I would do a bond rotation on, if I were to get one on the MCAT, is I would like under the table, like under the table, I'd start making like, like, so, like signs with my hand. And I would like assign, okay, methyl is like my pointer finger. Maybe you can write it down just to keep track. Like hydrogen is like my middle finger or something like that. And then I would rotate them. And then I would reassign and redraw um, the molecule in the rare again instance that something like this were to come up. So we had our methyl again up and out. We had our hydrogen up and to the back and we had our bromine down and to the right. If we rotate our bromine up, we got bromine is up and on a dash going backwards. Hydrogen is up and on a wedge going forwards and methyl is down and to the right. So, and then we can go ahead and omit our hydrogen for clarity. Did we have a meso compound? We sure did. Yep. <clears throat> we have two stereocenters with our bromines, but we have perfect symmetry in the middle. So this here will be a meso compound. And therefore it will be a chiral, it will not rotate plane polarized light. So any questions on this example here?
Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about types of stereoisomer relationship. Oh, yeah. So rotating bonds, usually not required for the MCAT. Correct. Yeah. Um, I like, I'm a completionist. Like I like to show everything the MCAT could throw at you. So that's the purpose of this example. But yeah, this would be fairly rare that you would have to do a bond rotation. And as a backup, uh, never mind. I was gonna, I was gonna talk about something, but it's actually not applicable here. We'll talk about it in a little while. So stereoisomer relationships. So we've defined isomers as molecules that have the same formula, but different molecules and stereoisomers being isomers that have all the same connectivity, but different orientations on one or more carbons. <clears throat> Sorry. So our first stereoisomer relationship is going to be diastereomers. So diastereomers will be molecules where between the two molecules, at least one stereoisomer, stereocenter, sorry, at least one stereocenter is inverted, but not all. At least one stereocenter inverted, but not all. And then within diastereomers, we have epimers. And epimers will be diastereomers with how many stereocenters inverted? Perfect, diastereomers with only one stereocenter inverted. In, uh, in practice, in, in organic chemistry, diastereomers will uh, sorry, epimers would be mostly applicable to sugars. That's kind of where the reason why we have this epimer word at all is related to sugars. Um, of course, any molecules that have our diastereomers, the only one stereocenter inverted could be. So a uh, question in the chat. So more diastereomers, we would need at least two chiral centers. Correct. Yep. So for molecules to be uh, diastereomers of each other, we will need to have at least two stereocenters. Because if we only have one stereocenter, then we would only have the potential of having an antiomers. Okay. And another important fact about diastereomers is the diastereomers will have different physical properties. Okay, so everyone's left different physical properties such as melting point, boiling point, as well as optical rotation. So this fact will be important when it comes to separations. If you have two diastereomers, you can easily do separations such as distillation, as we'll talk about in a little bit where because of the different boiling points, we can usually separate diastereomers using fractional distillation. So any questions on diastereomers? Why do diastereomers have different physical properties if they're physically the same, but they're different in spatial arrangements? That is a great question. Um, I don't know if I have sort of the caliber of of like terminology to really like tell you exactly why diastereomers have different physical properties. Um, yeah, I guess because they're different molecules um, that are not simply, as we'll talk about in a moment with enantiomers, where enantiomers we know are non superimposable mirror images, like your hands are enantiomers because they're non superimposable mirror images. Um, Whereas enantiomers, <clears throat> just being near images of each other, only differ in optical activity. 
Um, so do all isomers have different physical properties? Yes, all isomers should have different physical properties with the exception of enantiomers, which will have uh, identical as we'll talk about right now. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so especially, so we have like, for instance, um, if we have structural or constitutional isomers, those probably be even easier to separate because if we have like, for instance, a molecule with a primary alcohol, let's see, one, two, three carbons, one, two, three, four carbons, one, two, three, four carbons. So for instance, like these constitutional isomers would probably be the easiest to separate just because of the fact that we have like a tertiary alcohol versus a primary alcohol. So which one's gonna be better at hydrogen bonding? The primary or the tertiary? Which one would be better at hydrogen bonding? The primary, right? Because the tertiary is gonna be more sterically hindered. And so it's gonna be harder for that dude to hydrogen bond. Um, so this one would be expected to have a higher or a lower boiling point, the primary. Higher or lower boiling point. Should be a higher boiling point because we have higher hydrogen bonding capability. Yeah, so like constitutional isomers in general will be a lot easier to separate than diastereomers. So like these two molecules, for example, we could use like a simple distillation, whereas diastereomers would probably have to use like a fractional distillation. We'll go over the differences between those um, either, well, in the, for YouTube, that'll be in the next video. Uh, but we'll see if we get to that in our session today. Okay, so that was our first couple of stereoisomer relationships. In a few lectures from now, we'll talk about one other kind of diastereomer called anomers related to sugars. Enantiomers, on the other hand, will be non super imposable. <clears throat> mirror images. And we'll go over some examples, some practice problems for all of these. The classic example of an antimers, like we did a moment ago, is your hands. So if you have your hands out, your hands are obviously mirror images of each other, your right hand and your left hand. However, if we try to superimpose, turtle, we get, um, we are not able to superimpose. None of our fingers are actually lining up with their corresponding finger and our thumbs are sticking out on other sides. So that'd be one way to identify an antiomers if they are mirror images of each other, um, but they're non-superimposable. And another way to identify an antiomers is all, as opposed to diastereomers, where it's one or more, but not all, all stereocenters are inverted. And when it comes to enantiomers, enantiomers will have the same physical properties. Such as melting point, boiling point, and so when it comes to separating an antiomers, we'll need a special set of techniques that we will cover in the next video, possibly today. We'll need a special set of techniques to actually separate these because we can't use things like distillation for molecules that have the same physical properties such as boiling point. Now, when it comes to optical rotation, they will have the opposite optical rotation. So for instance, if, if molecules A and B <clears throat> are enantiomers and A rotates plane polarized light positive 50 degrees, how will B rotate plane polarized light?
Minus 50, perfect. Yep. And then if we do have a 50, uh, poor, poor use of 50 here. This <laughs> is just going to talk about a 50 50 mixture. Um, if we have a 50 50, uh, could you say that A is D and B is L? You could. Yep. So A would be dextrorotary and B would be levatorotary. Nice. So if you have a 50 50 mixture of enantiomers, what is the term for that? the term for a 50-50 mixture, racemic. Racemic mixture. Will a racemic mixture of enantiomers rotate plane polarized light? Yes or no? No. Rotates light zero degrees because the two enantiomers can't, yes, they cancel each other out, perfect. Okay, so any questions on enantiomers and diastereomers before we go into some examples? So um, the D and L notation, that doesn't directly correlate to R and S, right? Correct, yeah. <clears throat> so the little D and little L will have no correlation to either R and S or as well, big D and big L, um, which we'll talk about in a couple videos from now. So there's no correlation between R and S, and there's no correlation between big D and big L, which is probably why we have the plus and the minus, just to avoid confusion with the little D and the little L but you could definitely see both notations on the MCAT. Any other questions? All right. So let's do some practice problems on stereoisomer relationships. So we'll start with our reference molecule. <clears throat> one, two, three, four. Our reference molecule has a chlorine on a dash and it has a methyl, methyl on a wedge and it also has a methoxy on a dash. Okay. And then we'll go ahead and we'll number our carbons. This is not necessarily, well, it's, it's not the numbering we would use for nomenclature purposes, um, but it will be our reference um, numbering for when we look at our other molecules. So for this example, uh, we're going to apply stereoisomer relationship terms. We're going to apply stereoisomer relationship terms. And our first example to compare this against is Is this molecule. So if you're watching this at home, go ahead and pause your video and go ahead and work on this problem. And if you're in our session right now, go ahead and also work on this problem. Feel free to speak up for any questions.
Okay, so how should we approach this? We can start by numbering our carbons in a similar fashion. So we'll start with the uh, carbon that is closest to, that is on the end and closest to chlorine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So would these molecules be um, stereoisomers or would they be constitutional isomers? Can we rule out one or the other? Yes, uh, we could designate RNS. Um, it'll take a little bit of time, but your, your backup is always designating RNS and that will always work. Just takes a little more time. So we'll also look at some approaches for, uh, for, for figuring out the relationship without doing RNS. Yeah, these will be stereoisomers. We can rule out constitutional because we have the chlorine on three, we have the methyl on four, we have the methoxy on six. Okay, and so what would be the relationship between these molecules? Are they enantiomers, diastereomers, or are they identical? Enantiomers? Let's see. So if we were, for instance, to do what I like to call a pancake flip. So if we do a pancake flip, we are going to switch the direction the chain is facing. So we'll start with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And now because we flipped it, our OCH3 is on a dash. Our methyl on four, we flipped is on a wedge. And our chlorine on three, we flipped is on a dash. So what's the relationship between that and the original molecule? They're identical, yeah. So the answer for our first practice problem is identical. These are not stereoisomers. So any questions on our first example? Good, good. All right. That was a warm up. Now let's see. Down, up, down, up, down, up. Our methoxy, we have our methyl, and we have our chloro. So same idea, what is the relationship between the original molecule and this molecule? We can start by numbering in a similar fashion. So we can potentially rule out constitutional. So would these be constitutional or would they be stereo? Yeah, these guys are gonna be stereo. We still have the chlorine on four. We still have the methyl on uh, three, sorry, chlorine on three, methyl on four, methoxy on six. So would these be enantiomers or diastereomers? So we do have all of our groups in this molecule are on wedges, whereas so all of our all of our substituents are oriented in the same direction on this molecule, whereas methyl is oriented in the opposite direction as the chlorine and the methoxy on our reference molecule. So what does that tell us? These molecules are.
going to be diastereomers. These have to be diastereomers because our methyl group is oriented in the same direction as our methoxy and as our chloro. We could rotate this 180 degrees, turn it on its head, and then we'd have our methoxy up and on a wedge. We'd have our methyl up and on a wedge. We'd have our chloro down and on a wedge. Any questions on this one? All right. So three more practice problems. We'll get a relationship between our reference molecule and this molecule. Identical, close. So if we place a mirror right here and we work outwards from the mirror, methyl, we have methoxy on a dash, carbon, methyl on a wedge, chlorine on a dash, carbon, carbon. So are these mirror images? Are these mirror images? These would be mirror images. And that would make these an antiomers. We could also have done a pancake flip where our methoxy ends up over here on a wedge, our methyl ends up in the same place on a dash, and our chlorine ends up over here on a wedge. So we could also use our definition of nanotumors where all of the stereocenters are inverted. Okay, two more practice problems of this. And so for this problem, We have this guy. This guy's going to be a little tricky because our methoxy is now where carbon seven should be. So, what are we going to have to do to tackle this one? We'll have to do a bond rotation. Okay. So, Incorporated this one for another example of bond rotation. So let's go ahead and rotate this bond. Let's draw our hydrogen in for reference. And so now we have our methyl is up and to the back. Our methoxy is down and in the plane and our hydrogen is up and on a wedge, okay? So we have our methoxy group, we have our hydrogen, we have our methyl. So the goal is we wanna get our methyl to be in the plane where the methoxy is. So go, oh no, what have I done? <laughs> My wrist don't work that way. Um, let's see what I can do here. Methyl's up. And on a dash, hydrogen is up and on a wedge. Okay. Um, so then rotate uh, our methyl is now down and on a on the plane. Our methoxy is up and on a wedge. 
Our hydrogen is back and on a dash. Okay, one more time. You can watch me torture myself with this exercise. So we have methyls on a, on a dash in the back. We have our hydrogen up and on a wedge. We have our methoxy down and in the plane. And the goal is to get the methyl in the plane. So now we have methyl is in the plane. Methoxy is up and on a wedge. And our hydrogen is up and on a dash. Let me draw those before I forget. Methyl, methoxy, hydrogen. And we leave the rest of the molecule the same. And so what would be the relationship now between the small cool which we just drew, we can get rid of our hydrogen. Be the relationship now. Can we rule out constitutional? Yeah, we can rule out constitutional. And these would also be diastereomers because like our other problem now that we've done our rotation, Menthoxy is on a wedge. Um, all three of these are on a wedge. So they all have the same orientation relative to the skeleton and therefore they could not be an antimers, must be a diastereomer. So this is an example where you could also do RNS absolute configuration on our stereo center here if bond rotation isn't working out for you. Any questions? Okay, one more practice problem. And what would be the relationship now? Yep, this has got to be constitutional. Because we have an O propyl group, not an O methoxy group. Any questions on any of these problems here? All right. And then moving on, let's finish up our OCHEM toolkit lecture. We also have geometric isomers. Which will differ in substituent about the double bond. And geometric isomers is gonna be confusingly a type of diastereomer. I've never been able to figure out why we define this is, this is going to be cis and trans or E and Z. I've never been able to figure out why we define cis and trans and uh, slash E and Z as diastereomers, but that is the case. So for instance, if we have two different groups, X and Y, that are opposite. This be cis or trans. Be cis or trans. This would be trans. Would this be E or Z? This will be trans and E. Perfect. 
if we have x and y on the same side, let's be cis or trans. this and perfect Z. I'm not a huge fan of E and Z because E looks like it should be on the same side based on like the letter. Z looks like it should be on the opposite side because the letter is like, has the little like groups on the opposite side. So um, this mnemonic that is floating around there, which I first heard in um, uh, AP chemistry in high school is for Z, you say that the substituents are on the same side. Yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, you say cis with a German accent, this, nice. Um, likewise, my AP chem teacher would say, if the substituents are on the same side of the alkene, it is a Z. The same side, um, and I don't. I don't know. You can say like E and opposite or something like that. Yeah. Let's do a practice problem for geometric isomers. So um, how do we approach this now that there's four groups that are not hydrogen? First, we'll look at each stereo, or sorry, each carbon making the double bond and give priority to the two substituents. So who is gonna get the priority one, bromine or chlorine? And this is also by atomic number, ER. And then on the other side, look at this carbon now, who's gonna get the higher priority, isopropyl or regular propyl? Iso or regular propyl, isopropyl. And then we sort of like cut the double bond through the middle. And would this be cis or trans, E or Z? Perfect. Cis and Z. Any questions on this example? All right. Lastly, just some things to remember in summary from our lecture on Stereochem. R S is a designation for one chiral center. R and S is a designation for one chiral center. Tells you nothing about uh, optical activity. Plus minus tells you optical rotation. And it has a one to one correlation with little d and little l, which we said correspond to dextrorotary and levator-rotary. Any questions on anything we covered in our lesson so far today for YouTube while we're still recording? All right, so that wraps things up for stereochemistry and our OCHEM fundamental toolkit. And 
I will see you in the next video.